Hey, there they are. Oops. I think we're, I think we're rolling here, making sure we weren't on mute. So, hi there, American History class. I hope you're doing okay. Um, it's been a full week. So this is for, I'm recording this on on uh, Thursday evening here, and and uh, this will be posted. So this is for our scheduled topic on Friday, April 17th. Actually, as you can see here on the slide, I'm, I'm gonna carry that forward into Monday the 20th when we roll into a discussion of the 1980s. But we have to talk about the 1970s first, obviously. So um, just a couple of reminders. So not tonight, but probably sometime by tomorrow afternoon, I'm planning on having a um, study suggestions guide. Excuse me. Need a drink of coffee here, apparently. I'm going to have a study suggestions guide posted for you on Converge. And so just look for that uh, late afternoon or evening tomorrow, and, and that, will, uh, that will give you about nine, ten days with that study guide before you guys end up taking the uh, the final exam, which will be very similar format to what we just did and what I finally graded and got back to you guys. So just kind of coming one on top of the other, but but I think you'll be just fine. So be looking for that. And again, just a reminder, because some of you are, uh, are just uh, kind of putting things off till the last and, and you have that choice, which is fine. But remember, you have to complete two film reviews from the sheet that that uh, you received at the beginning of the semester. And some of you have not yet done one, so remember that you're, you're running out of options, so please keep that in mind. The other thing, I have gotten a couple of questions regarding what this 100-point um, uh, paper is that's now listed in Converge. So remember that, uh, first and foremost, remember to check your email, okay? Because I, I did send out a very detailed uh, email through Converge system on this. Uh, that paper is is actually the uh, the updated assignment since I'm I'm just not able to have you guys submit semester notes the way that you would have before. But I, I did not want to eliminate that hundred point assignment because that would deeply affect many of your grades. And some of those, some you know, the effect of that could have been pretty negative for a, a lot of students. So I wanted to keep the 100 point assignment and give you guys an opportunity to do something that you could pull off here. So uh, go on to Converge and under announcements, you'll see um, that, there, that there is a, maybe two weeks ago, about two weeks ago, I, I submitted this where it talks about an updated assignment instead of the semester notes. So please go in and find that. And I've laid out the, the expectations for the paper very specifically. And that will be due on the day that you guys end up. Uh, actually, I think I have it due on, on April 24th. I'll double check that, but I don't have it right in front of my, my eyes right now. So I think that actually is due Friday the 24th, which is a week from now. Uh, I will double check that and and adjust that if, if needs be, um, but uh, adjust my, my statement if needs be, but I'm pretty sure that's the due date. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. So let's, let's dip into our topic because I don't, wanna, I don't wanna hold us up too long. So we're gonna start with, uh, before we get to Watergate, I, I wanna try to find a way to frame the end of the Vietnam conflict because you know, it doesn't end in 1968 or 69 when the Tet Offensive takes place. And actually what happens is, is Nixon, Richard Nixon wins election in the fall of 68 and begins his first term in office in 1969. And, and the, the war in Vietnam at that point is a priority. Remember that we're framing this very much through the lens of the Cold War still. And so what is happening in Southeast Asia and Vietnam uh, according to U.S. policymakers like Richard Nixon and his national security advisor, uh, Henry Kissinger, they are framing 
this through the ongoing lens of the Cold War and, and containment policy. So containing communism and, and keeping it from spreading to these other areas of the world. That is at least ostensibly the goal from a very, very broad strategic political perspective. But the military aspects of the war in Vietnam have not, not been positive. This has been a war of attrition. It has been a war uh, it's called a protracted war. We as, as military historians, that's typically what we, we reference here. So a protracted war is a war that, that drags on and on and on with seemingly no actual military resolution in sight. And despite the intention to end the war quickly beginning in 1965 and 66, the war dragged on and on and more and more troops were sent to Vietnam. And, and that became a problem after the Tet Offensive, as we have said. So when Nixon comes to office, he and his, his national security advisor and his secretary of state, they decide that, that there needs to be an adjustment to US policy in Vietnam. And they introduce a concept called Vietnamization. What a horribly long word. Some of the time, you know, I kind of kind of wish that we'd let others uh, take a hold of the the terminology that's attached to various aspects of history because some of these things they've got to be you know more pronounceable and understandable names. Uh, the concept for Vietnamization was basically this. So say Vietnamization. <laughs> okay, so that's that's the way that word is spelled and is pronounced Vietnamization. And the whole concept for that is this, it's, it's essentially uh, that the United States is going to begin to downplay its roles in South Vietnam, and it will begin a very gradual, a very slow withdrawal of US troops beginning in 1969 and 1970. And in the midst of this very slow withdrawal process, the United States will, will ostensibly train the South Vietnamese army to fight this fight on their own, that, that they are going to be uh, responsible by the early 1970s for bringing this war to fruition and ensuring that they achieve uh, a, a true independent state in South Vietnam and that that is maintained. The idea that, that this, this will be a worthwhile effort because the United States will leave a free and independent and democratic South Vietnam intact when we leave. That is the stated goal. Uh, a couple of things to keep in mind. So the YOP text mentions a couple of, of elements in passing and doesn't dig into a whole lot of detail, which I wouldn't expect because it's a survey survey text after all, an online survey text. Um, so it would be wrong to assume that the United States in 1970 and 71 and 72 was, was not still engaging in, in the war and that the United States was not engaging in significant military operations. There were still some ground operations. The US forces were still there, even though they were being downsized to a degree. Um, but what we did step up was our, our air campaigns. And so there are a number of critical and massive bombing campaigns of primarily, of course, primar uh, centering on North Vietnam, but also some illegal campaigns that crossed some borders into Cambodia and Laos. And the goal for the Nixon administration is to kind of force Viet North Vietnam to reconsider its own military strategies and tactics and and maybe even to force the North Vietnamese to the bargaining table so that when the US fully withdraws all of its troops, a, a distinct and formalized peace treaty can be in place that guarantees the existence of South Vietnam. So these are the events that, that are critical as we think about the winding down of the Vietnam War. So a couple of intervening moments that I just need to mention in passing. So the United States citizenry has lived through you know, some of the more tumultuous moments culturally. Certainly the Vietnam War has been a centerpiece of controversy beginning in, in 1967 and 68. 
we seemed to have moved past some of that, and yet there are some incidents that come to the forefront regarding Vietnam and US military policy that are extremely disconcerting, that are extremely upsetting to the American public. And one of them that I want to mention in passing, so I'm gonna come back to Kent State in a minute. Um, there is an incident, you know, I don't have a slide of it, I apologize. So there's, Whoa. There's an incident that comes to light in the U.S. press. It is actually, uh, it was actually when it happened, it was covered up by U.S. military high command for a time, and it's called the My Lai incident, M-Y-L-A-I, uh, typically referred to, in fact, as the My Lai massacre, in which U.S. combat forces in Vietnam uh, in, in at least in partial response to the loss of some of their comrades in some campaigns and battles in the, pre, in the preceding few months, where a, uh, a group of soldiers in Vietnam marched into two hamlets in, in the South and brutally murdered the civilian populations, these, the Vietnamese populations in those villages, later claiming that there was absolute proof that those Vietnamese villagers had been supplying the enemy with food and war material for, for missions against U.S. troops, which did happen in, in some cases throughout the war. Uh, that was not the case in either the Mi Lai or the Mi K hamlets that were ravaged by these U.S. forces. And I want you to understand that that they that these killings were were just brutal, and they involved killing men, women, young children, elderly, animals in the village, and it was indiscriminate and horrid. Uh, and I won't describe the nature of the killings here. I, I just I don't think I want to burden you with that, but. Trust me when I tell you, when the realities of the My Lai incident were fully revealed and that there had in fact, uh, current numbers by the way, the declassified material tells, shows us, reveals that um, hundreds, as many as, uh, as many as 400 or eight, maybe even 500 innocent people were, were murdered by US troops in the My Lai massacre. The problem occurred for U.S. high command because there were journalists attached to these uh, these different battalions that were present and actually took pictures of some of the events, uh, and these pictures were ultimately published. Uh, there were a couple of pilots and a few of the the junior officers that actually did not go along with the orders given uh, by by the two key individuals, Captain Medina or Lieutenant William Calley, who ordered their men to start killing these Vietnamese people. Many others uh, did obviously go along, but there were several who did not, and they, they submitted immediately, submitted reports, detailed reports about the incident that for a time were covered up. But when the cover-up broke, when the realities began to leak, and when the American public found out about the My Lai incident nearly two, two and a half years after it had actually occurred, um, well, the, the proverbial excrement hit the fan, as we say, right? And, and that obviously gave the, uh, the war in Vietnam an additional black eye. Now, Nixon could rightly claim that he came to office uh, you know, as, uh, you know, after the incident had really uh, already been dealt with and covered up. So ironically, Nixon may not have been directly responsible for any cover up with me lie. But of course, it's, you know, the American public is going to hold the, the chief executive accountable, who they believe is attached to these particular moments in time. So, so whether it was Nixon or Johnson who deserved the the primary responsibility um, didn't seem to matter to some at the time. What, it, what did matter was that U.S. policy in Vietnam continued to be an out-and-out -out disaster. So uh, incidents like the My Lai, the release of the My Lai massacre information 
that obviously caused a lot of upset. The, the revelation that U.S. bombing missions were actually occurring illegally across borders in, in South Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia really upset people. There were demonstrations on college campuses in several parts of the country, in, including at Kent State University where uh, guardsmen were called in and there was a, a pretty brutal engagement. A couple of students were shot. Uh, a couple of them, in fact, died. So th this, this is just, uh, you know, when we think about Vietnam, the Vietnam era and its impact on American society, it is so much more than the actual combat zones over in Southeast Asia. The effects on American culture were real. The, the pushback, the war protests, these things began to, to take on a life of their own and, and began to grow in nature by the time we get to 1970 and 71. Um, now it's wrong to, it would be wrong and, and I think dishonest to misrepresent this and say that the vast majority of Americans, if, even after all of these incidents, it would be wrong to say that the vast majority of Americans were marching in the streets as, as some might believe. It, it never approached that. Even at its height, the protest movements uh, regarding the Vietnam conflict anyway, those protest movements were, were relatively small by comparison. Most historians now would, would say that we're probably dealing with 15% or maybe even 10% of the U.S. population at the time was really mobilized in visible and ardent protest of the war. But of course, those movements got an awful lot of press and a lot of, an awful lot of of camera time and news time. So, you know, sometimes that's the nature of the beast. Protest movements do get an awful lot of attention. That is typically the way it goes. So it can seem that protests are, are perhaps far more explosive and far more dramatic than they may actually be. Having said that, I do not want to minimize the fact that there were many thousands of Americans who were becoming increasingly upset by America's involvement in Vietnam. And and Nixon and his White House staff, his policymakers, realized this, which helps to explain the, the ratcheting down of U.S. direct U.S. involvement in Vietnam. There is a commitment to get American forces out of South Vietnam by 1973. There's even a, an armistice of sorts that comes about. It doesn't work perfectly. There actually end up being some some additional insults flying between the United States and the North Vietnamese and a couple of, of bombing raids that happened in 1973 and 74. But ultimately we reached this, this surreal moment in time when, when under the Nixon administration, uh, actually this is April of 75, so this would have been uh, Gerald Ford at the time. So the Nixon administration issued the orders and the policies, but as we will talk about in a moment, the Watergate scandal had already broken and Nixon had already resigned when this particular scene takes place. So in April of 1975, in, in one of the strangest moments that Americans can probably remember watching on television, the U.S. Embassy in Saigon is being, uh, is being evacuated uh, hastily. And as reporters, as American, the American press members who are still actually there, who are documenting this, they could actually hear the artillery of the North Vietnamese and their VC comrades approaching Saigon from a few miles away. The, the penetration of the South had already occurred. Uh, the, the U.S. and South Vietnamese ally forces had melted away at the at the, uh, the onslaught, at the onrushing NVA and VC forces. And so here you have this, this horrible, chaotic scene in Saigon. After all of the time, after all of the money, after all of the effort, after everything about the Vietnam War that Americans had been watching for well over a decade, if we go back to the 1950s, it was you know, nearly 20 years. Um, but certainly for the past decade, from 1965 to this moment, the Vietnam War comes to a screeching halt as Americans watch, you know, uh, the, these panicked scenes 
of not only US citizens departing on these Huey choppers at the top of the US Embassy, but panicked South Vietnamese who had been American allies and had been known to be allied with Americans in Saigon were panicked and trying to get out of Saigon before the arrival of the Northern Communist forces because they knew that they were gonna be found and they were either gonna be imprisoned or they were gonna be executed. And you have you know, some of the most surreal moments as, as American audiences in some cases were watching. There's a CBS news broadcast, in fact, where it showed helicopters taking off from the embassy roof and, and panicked South Vietnamese civilians wanting to get themselves and or their families out of Saigon before the arrival of the NVA, before the arrival of the communists. Uh, they they were hanging to the bottom, hanging on to the bottom of the choppers. Some of them actually apparently hung on long enough to leave Saigon and and go out over the ocean toward the U.S. aircraft carriers, but dropped off into the sea. Uh, what what a, what a what a surreal end to this long fought and disastrous American war. And so that happens in April of 1975, and it must have been one of the strangest things that Americans watched during the course of the decade. And yet, nothing could possibly be stranger than, than what we're gonna talk about in a minute. Before I get to Watergate though, I do wanna mention Nixon and Dayton. So, um, to dismiss Richard Nixon merely as uh, you know, a corrupt politician regarding the Watergate scandal and to completely eliminate the other accomplishments of the Nixon White House, I do not think that that is historically helpful. Uh, we're certainly gonna you know, acknowledge the damage that Nixon and, and uh, Nixon specifically, but uh, his, some of his staff members, the, uh, the punishment that they, that they uh, conveyed on the American people, but it is important, especially from a foreign policy standpoint, to acknowledge some really important and positive things accomplished by the Nixon White House. And there are two components of this. Detente means, so the, the, the term detente, by the way, simply means kind of a, I'll call it a meeting of the minds. So this is a softening of tensions between the US and the Soviets, as well as the US and the Chinese. So. Uh, Nixon and Kissinger both believed in something they called triangular diplomacy, which was to say trying to improve the individual relationships between the U.S. and the Soviets and the individual relationship between the U.S. and the Chinese. And there was also kind of an ulterior motive here, the idea that, that if they could perhaps pit the Soviets and the Chinese against one another and that perhaps those two countries would, would have some mutual weakening, which at the same time would strengthen the United States and its position in the world. So that is a, that is a very simplistic um, overview of triangular diplomacy, but I think you get the idea. So the Nixon administration actually made some serious inroads in, in improving its relations. There were some, uh, you know, some, some economic trade negotiations made between both, both countries, the US uh, and the Soviets and the Chinese. So both of those nations were prepared to open up and allow for, you know, especially some of the agricultural deals between the Soviets and the Americans because the Soviet Union really struggled with its agricultural policy. Uh, there were some initial meetings about uh, changing the the nature of the missile defense systems between the Soviets and the United States, those didn't go very far under Nixon. So those, those become much more important under Carter and Reagan, but still those are the early components of those negotiations occur in Nixon's time. Of the two, uh, it, it's really interesting, although obviously we would expect that the Soviet Union is, is the primary centerpiece here, the reality is, is, the, is the opposite. The relations that were struck up between a, an ailing Mao Zedong, very old Mao Zedong, and, and Richard Nixon, the fact that, that Nixon himself, this 
this, you know, virulent anti-communist going back to the 1940s and 50s. You know, Nixon was around during the Red Scare, for instance. Nixon had been, you know, his his anti-communist rhetoric and his anti-communist positions were legendary. And so it's often said, you know, only Nixon could go to China, right? Because his his anti-communist, his his zealous anti-communist stance um, was unquestioned. And so Nixon actually accomplishes in 1972, he goes on this, this famous trip to China to try to do what he could, he and Kissinger both, to do what they could to improve US relations with China. And, and there were some measurable improvements, uh, not only some really effective and valuable trade partnerships, mutual trade partnerships, but I think a, a, an element of, of um, improving trust maybe at a very basic level at first, but improving trust between the countries instead of, of basing relations largely on, on propaganda, confusion, and hearsay, and, and a, lot of, uh, a lot of speculation, essentially. And so to try to open up the lines of communication and to, to decrease as many barriers as possible. These were not perfect missions. These were not perfect diplomatic resolutions, but it was a start. And the Nixon administration deserves some serious credit for trying to open up the doors of negotiation and communication with both the Soviets and the Chinese and to try to you know, downplay some of the, or try to improve upon some of the inherent dangers between these countries be, because of the levels of intense distrust that existed between them. So that's a really important element. But now, of course, we have to move to the, uh, oh, I do, I wanna mention this in passing. Boy, culturally, man, there's, there's just been so, there, there have been so many repercussions from the Roe v. Wade decision, which, which formally um, brought the legalized abortion stance to the forefront. And it's, it's one uh, for, for, for Christians, especially those you know Christians who regard this, I think rightly so, as an abomination, right? Um, this this case, even by legal scholars who aren't Christian, this case is a classic representation of what is often termed uh, legislating from the bench, whereby the Supreme Court did not rely on precedent, case law, to inform its decision. It actually uh, aligned itself with very partisan, uh, very arbitrary, very partisan um, contemporary arguments being made by, by U.S. citizens at the time. And so when we say legislating from the bench, what we basically mean is, is the, the judicial body was, was not in a sense, performing its crucial role, which was to declare what the Constitution really said about issues of this nature. And so the, the Roe v. Wade decision continues to be controversial even now in the 21st century, and the, the critique of it has always been that this was not a case that was decided on constitutionality or case law or any sort of legal precedent, but it was instead a you know something more akin to you know a contemporary agenda being being brought to fruition by the highest court in the land which is a very problematic place to be okay so the watergate scandal i don't you guys don't need to know a whole lot about the pentagon papers so i'm going to flash through that right now the watergate scandal this can become a you know kind of an overwhelming component, right, of, of American history. And what I want you to know is that you guys are not going to be rolling through and explaining every detailed sequence of the scandal. I do, however, need you to know the big picture. So the, the start of this is actually in 1972, when Richard Nixon is, is preparing for the the fall election, the 1972 election. And something that you have to know about Richard Nixon's personality is this. He, he had a tendency to, uh, 
uh, he had some delusional tendencies. And what that means in, in this case is that he became, he became paranoid and kind of allowed himself to believe that he was going to have a, a very difficult chance to be reelected because of the Vietnam conflict, because of some, you know, uh, the, the end of the civil rights movement as it, as it had taken place in the 1960s, because the American people were, you know, he, he was convinced that they might hold him responsible for failures in Vietnam. Anyway, Nixon convinced himself that winning re-election was unlikely and maybe even virtually impossible. And so he formed this really interesting committee, which has one of the stupidest acronyms in all of American history. The committee was called the Committee to Re-elect the President, only the acronym was CREEP. <laughs> maybe there's some justice <laughs> in the fact that the acronym was, was CREEP. But Within this committee to reelect the president, the, the, the decision was made that the, the Nixon campaign required detailed information about their adversaries in the Democratic Party. So there's a famous break in into the Watergate Hotel complex in Washington, D.C., where uh, the Democratic National Con uh, Committee was holding their meetings and a lot of their material was stashed. And so, so there's this, this famous break-in in 1972 of the Watergate complex. And these, uh, these numbskulls, these nincompoops who broke in apparently, I mean, I can't say that I'm some sort of a professional thief, of course, but I mean, I would imagine that I would take more care in planning such an operation, especially given the, the, the implications of it. But uh, these nincompoops broke into the Watergate complex and they're wandering around, you know, through the, the floors of the Democratic Party in this hotel complex. In the middle of the night, they're walking around with fl flashlights and making too much noise. And security guards, you know, became aware. It's not too hard when you see flashlights, you know, in windows and, you know, kind of you start to suspect, oh, that doesn't seem quite right. So uh, authorities were called the the thieves were apprehended and this was the start, okay? So what unfolds with the Watergate scandal is, is as information just gradually came about and was gradually released, it becomes increasingly clear that the thieves, that the break-in, um, that's bad enough, but that subsequently there had been an effort to cover up who was responsible for all of this activity, and that that cover up increasingly was traced back and back and back and back, ultimately to the White House and to Nixon himself. Uh, investigative reporters, Wood, uh, Bob Woodward, Woodward and his colleague, Bernstein, these two reporters for the Washington Post famously are, you know, doggedly determined to, to trace this all to the, the source. And they are one of the investigative teams responsible for bringing this information to light with the American public over a, a sequence of time. So over time, you have an increasing numbers of the Nixon administration who are subpoenaed by the federal government, by, by the Department of Justice, and forced to, to come and and give testimony and are under oath admitting their part. And over time, as I said, it increasingly becomes clear that this is going to be traced back to the White House and ultimately to President Nixon himself. What happens is there's the, the damning evidence ends up being a, a, an Oval Office tape recording system that Nixon himself had installed because he didn't want to go through the rigmarole of having secretaries take down, you know, dictation. And so he had conversations in the Oval Office recorded about all sorts of subjects under the sun. And when Nixon was subpoenaed to hand over the tape recordings of certain dates where subjects were ostensibly being discussed, Nixon refused and said that, that he had executive privilege and that 
it involved national security and therefore he, he shouldn't have to hand over those tapes and went back and forth and back and forth and ultimately he was ordered to submit those tapes. Strangely, of course, when Nixon finally did acquiesce and hand the tapes over, uh, some numbskull, which may have in fact just been him sitting in one, you know, one room in the White House some night, somebody had doctored the tapes and erased crucial segments by, you know, by hand, you know, through the erase function on, you know, a handheld tape recorder. Uh, so very, you know, definitely not a professional job, but very, very starkly and carelessly done. That was also viewed as damning evidence. So the case was built against the Nixon White House. There were several of his aides, such as famously such as his hatchet man, Chuck Colson, Charles Colson, who served Nixon in the White House. Colson was given prison time, and there were others who were also given prison time. Um, John Dean, one of the guys involved with the, the Watergate scandal, famously just came clean and gave the Justice Department all sorts of information during, during his Senate trial. Uh, so all of this information comes to the forefront and it becomes clear by the, the late summer of 1974 that in fact Richard Nixon has been lying, that, the, that he has ordered the cover up, that he's been ordering all sorts of guys in his, his circle of trust to, to protect him and to not give him up and to not come clean on what actually happened. And uh, there were articles of impeachment that were drawn up. And so the reality comes to this. Uh, in the Senate trial that would have happened, Richard Nixon was almost assuredly, assuredly gonna be convicted and he and almost assuredly would have been removed from office, okay? What you need to know is that that did not happen because Richard Nixon, in a preemptive move, decided that the writing was on the wall and there was nothing else he could do. And despite all of his claims that you know he was the president and he didn't have to abide by these judicial strictures, uh, he was going to lose this fight. And so he resigned the office in August of 1974. And there's the famous photograph that you see there as he walks out across the White House lawn and border and boards Marine One for the last time and is flown away, you know, into the sunset, so to speak. And that is one of the most famous images of the late 20th century. Uh, Nixon border, boarding the, uh, the White House helicopter there and departing office. Uh, what I would say is this, Richard Nixon seems to have forgotten all sorts of elements uh, with the Constitution, specifically the idea that, that even the chief executive in our nation's government is supposed to be held responsible for crimes against the state, and that just because he or she happens to be president, they are not free from justice. Nixon, one of his major defenses always, you know, continued to be, I'm the president, I don't you know, I essentially don't answer for, you know, answer the same way, answer in the same ways to these kinds of situations. And, and basically the Justice Department's response was, well, actually, yes, Mr. President, you, you do. And, and these are uh, high crimes and misdemeanors against the office that you hold. And, and he was held accountable. So uh, that's the Watergate scandal. The aftermath of this is really interesting. Uh, Gerald Ford, his, uh, by the way, Gerald Ford wasn't even Nixon's vice president uh, initially. He comes into the role um, primarily because Nixon's VP was brought up on a completely different scandal uh, and removed from office. So Gerald Ford steps into the role and. And Ford pardoned, famously pardoned Richard Nixon. And uh, it, is, it is a move that dooms Gerald Ford to, uh, in 1976, the American people, I don't think in a sense we're ready to forgive Gerald Ford, many Americans, we're not prepared to forgive Gerald Ford for pardoning Richard Nixon. And it totally damaged him in the 1976 election. Um, so these are, man, these are tumultuous moments 
in American culture. Which brings us to Ford, as I said. So Gerald Ford, a former Michigan football player, steps into the presidency, and uh, he's only he's only there for a couple of years. His legacy has actually gone through a real resurgence in the last few years, and I think rightly so. Uh, Ford was a good man, pretty a pretty good, capable executive, but because he his he was of the same political party as Nixon, and because he had taken the action of pardoning Nixon in that critical moment, he was, I mean, maybe maybe committing political suicide in a sense. Um, in in retrospect, I think a lot of Americans have have looked favorably on Ford's decision, realizing that at that moment, putting the Watergate scandal behind the American people and moving on was really essential because it had dominated in a very dark way it had dominated so much of American life for years. Um, and, and, it's, and the Nixon administration's connect, connection to failures in Vietnam certainly are part of that. And Ford, Ford decided that it was not in America's best interest to, to go through a long drawn out you know, um, political circus in the wake of the Watergate incident. And um, it's debatable, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, I certainly question some of the ethics there, but there, there at least can, the, the argument can be made that his decision to pardon Richard Nixon was a meaningful one and that it released Americans from the burden of, of all of the Watergate scandal that had, had really been so negative for so long. I want to skip to Jimmy Carter uh, because I want to deal with the last couple years of the 1970s. Carter, by the way, a Naval Academy graduate, um, served as, as governor of Georgia prior to becoming president. Carter defeats Gerald Ford in the 1976 election and takes office in 1977. And unfortunately for Carter, although I think he was and is a very good man, still alive, by the way, uh, very old. Uh, very, very old, as you can see, uh, closing in on 100. We'll see if he gets there. Uh, Jimmy Carter, uh, first and foremost, you should know, uh, uh, born again Christian, and made a made that a very a key component of his, uh, you know, his bio and and a lot of the interviews that he was giving in 1976. A very well intentioned man. Uh, I I I would would never for a second doubt that. Unfortunately for Carter, he ended up coming into office at one of the more difficult times in American history. And he, he failed to, to, to be the chief executive that, that America needed at that point and was just too many flawed policies, uh, just, just too many mistakes, both domestic policy and foreign policy. Uh, some very careless uh, socioeconomic decisions and trade negotiations with several Middle Eastern companies uh, really backfired as far as oil policy was concerned at that moment in time. So much so that American, uh, you know, American oil uh, uh, trade negotiations, America, America's oil importation was traumatized in 1977 and 78 to the point where uh, the cost of, of buying a tank of gasoline for most Americans just became outrageously expensive. And, and also the, the supply was extremely limited for a time. And, and I can still tell you, I remember I was a very small boy. I mean, I was, I was like five, six years old, but I still actually remember sitting in line at gas stations uh, for an hour and a half, you know, hour, hour and a half at times. Uh, waiting in these outrageous long lines to just get like five bucks of gas uh, in in our cars, and uh, you know that was that that's not something Americans have been used to. And many blamed Carter. I'm not sure he's, you know, he he's the the lone individual to blame. But of course, the buck stops with the president, and that did not sit well with a lot of Americans. Um, his his foreign policy initiatives were were kind of twofold. There, there, there are different levels of success. Carter does deserve pre a, a lot of credit for manufacturing a critical improvement of relations between uh, Israel and Egypt in the Middle East uh, 
which ultimately came to fruition in March of 1979. Uh, the, the Israeli prime minister, his name is Menachem Begin, it's the way that name is, it looks like Begin, his name is actually pronounced Begin. Uh, Menachem Begin and the Egyptian president Anwar Sadat signed a, a critical peace treaty in March of 1979 that could have ultimately been, uh, could have ultimately provided some serious inroads to a more stabilized peace in the Middle East. Unfortunately for Carter, as, as well-intentioned and as significant as the treaty could have been, it did not come to fruition because soon after the treaty was signed, uh, Anwar Sadat was assassinated, and there were other countries, Syria being one of them, there were other countries in the Middle East that tried to ensure that, that Israel was, uh, was not going to be allowed to exist as it ought to be or, or as it wanted to exist, and that, and that U.S.-Israeli relations were to be viewed as a danger to other Islamic-based countries in the Middle East. And the reactions against the United States and Israel were, were negative and they were stepped up to a large degree. This is most clearly seen in the infamous Iran hostage crisis, which began in 1979, when a bunch of, of uh, American embassy personnel were seized by a, a group of, of zealous followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. And Khomeini's followers held these, these American personnel hostage for just over a year, uh, about a year and maybe three and a half months. So, you know, about, about 15 month time period or so, the Iran hostages were, were held. And this was a, an effort to insult the United States, to, uh, to call into question America's place in the Middle East, questions about American uh, uh, policy in Iran prior to this point, specifically uh, its installment of the, uh, the leader called the Shah of Iran, who was a horribly, absolutely horrid, corrupt individual who the United States backed because essentially we, we felt we could run him. He could serve as something of a, of a puppet uh, leader for us in Iran. When the Shah's government was toppled and the Ayatollahs took over, they, they told anyone who was listening uh, about how horrid the United States really was, the evil Satan of the West. Uh, this is really in many respects the, the birthplace, the, one of the critical jump off points, I should say, one of the critical crossroads for the antagonistic relations between the Middle East and the United States and it has obviously grown from there on into the 21st century. Ironically, the hostages, by the way, were all released by the Ayatollah uh, and his followers literally the day that President Ronald Reagan took the oath of office in 1981, in January of 1981. And so this was the release of those hostages was a final insult aimed at the Carter administration. All right, guys, that's all I have for you right now. So we're gonna come back on and for Monday's scheduled class period, we're gonna dip into the 1980s and I'll do both a political and cultural overview. And that's where we're gonna go with that. Make sure that you read that entire American Yawp chapter prior to Monday, because that will be important background for you. I think that's it. Look for the, the post of the study suggestions, but until then, I hope you're well, and I will connect with you again soon.